What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you a special edition of Block Digest on Sunday, January 3rd, 2021, with Mr. Pedro McCormick, and also joining us, Mr. Chris Ellis. So what is going on, hobbits from the Shire? Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me on. And what's up with you today, Janine? Uh-oh. Does she need some technical help? Chris, did she get killed by the cats? <laughs> it's entirely possible. One sec, I'll go check. You need a life check, quick. Those cats are vicious, horribly behaved animals. She'll be with us momentarily. Mm -hmm. Well, while we wait for that, um, Peter, I Hello. was wondering uh, what, what your opinion is on the incentive change if we were to require upfront fees for routing payments over the Lightning Network instead of only paying them during a successful payment. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you know what? I've got some evidence for you. What's that? So, so I obviously did the interview with Matt over the weekend. I've had quite a few emails coming in that are quite interesting because we obviously we obviously had that argument over um, X pubs where he thought I was lying. I disagreed with both of you. How can you disagree with both of us? Uh, well, there was more than one answer to the types of things you were talking about. Well, bear in mind, I don't actually remember recording the last half an hour. Yeah, I guess that's where we're most different. I don't drink at all. I've never drank. Yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it's fun. Um, I actually gave up for a long time last year, but it's Christmas. But yes, so... what is your evidence, Peter? Yes, cough, cough up this evidence that people can't uh, comprehend an XPUB. Hold on, I'm just trying to find the email, but basically, this is where I just need to, you need to give me a moment. Tell me about the Lightning stuff while I dig this out. Well, interesting dynamic with Lightning is you don't pay any fees for making a payment unless that payment successfully resolves. So it's really easy to DDoS people and lock up liquidity in a channel. But if you require people to pay fees for a payment with no guarantee that it goes through, can you see the problem there from a normal user's point of view? Well, the problem for a normal user is even having to think or care about this stuff. Exactly. Like, don't, isn't it just counterintuitively weird and off-putting and just an odd thing that you would have to pay a fee even though your payment didn't go through? Uh, yeah, I mean, that would be mildly disappointing. Would you want to make payments with a tool like that? Probably not. No, I probably wouldn't. See there, Peter, you can understand technical things. You just did. See? <laughs> yeah, I mean... I can understand certain things. Uh, I just always want things to be really super easy to use and not really have to care about things like this. But I'm but, selfish. But now you do. And, and you not only care, you understood. There's a problem with the Lightning Network. Here's a solution. That solution has a problem for users. You, you put it all together and you picked it up, dude. I think you've uh, railroad, railroaded me into agreeing with you. Okay, so you know, <laughs> what, <laughs> what I told him is that we would talk about especially now that we happen to be recording on Bitcoin's 12th birthday, um, that we would talk about what it's been like to do podcasting Bitcoin-focused stuff since I think we both started in 2017. So we have an almost equal amount of time doing this stuff. Yeah, I can't I, find this I, email anyway. I had to get my ribbings in. It's fine. It's fine. I can handle it. Actually, Janine has been brilliantly in the background, of kind of guiding me into uh, caring about some things a little bit more, which has been very useful. So thank you, Janine. Okay. Percentage-wise, how close are you to caring? Caring about what? Well, it, you just said that I successfully <laughs> have been trying to get you to care. So how close are you to caring about the things that I've been encouraging you to care about? Well, I don't think I'm going to go off-grid, live in an underground kind of bunker and start using tools like Mumble on a regular basis. Um, but I 
I think I am having a wider appreciation of privacy in general and uh, anything in the form of, of regulation which comes to like destroy privacy. Like I, I'm, yeah, I, I'm caring more about that and, and considering that I should start making more content in that kind of direction. Um, but I'm also that still in that kind of practical world where I. I think, but most people aren't like you and Shinobi, and they they don't. I can't put mumble in front of anyone. I like as I say to my dad, it's like, yeah, dad, no, we're not going to use Zoom tonight. We're going to use mumble. Like we would just, it'd be a shit show. So, um, but I I care broadly. Um, yeah, I definitely care more broadly. I feel like I've got, you know, about a couple of years ago, I had this little Shinobi who was on my shoulder all the time, like giving me <laughs> giving giving me shit about like shit coins and he was right literally. Eventually. yeah literally and he completely changed my direction of what i was doing because of that and that was good and healthy and I, i've now got on the other shoulder a little janine although i've got no idea what janine looks like she looks like the to me it's, every time i think of you i think the girl with the dragon tattoo and uh they're just like reminding me to consider privacy well i mean it's really important man and uh I like I, I get your point that normal people don't worry about these things and don't want to use these things, but I mean, come on, dude, we just got out of 2020. I mean, I think that should be all the examples necessary as to why normal people should care about these things and very soon are going to have to. Yeah, it's just very difficult getting people to take that leap. Uh getting people to even consider bitcoin is a very very hard leap getting them to really con you know if you if you really cared about your privacy you would immediately delete most of your social media uh, accounts certainly your facebook and you know you'd deactivate all your google tracking on your phone and you probably wouldn't even have an iphone and blah 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 but i think a lot of people will uh, happily they make privacy sacrifices for ease of use which isn't great but it's just kind of like a like a reality you're, you're kind of opening a door here with social media like why why not i mean like what do you really use social media for except to either consume content from people with very large audiences or talk to people in a much smaller social group i think you, know, it... you you just asked a marketing person what do you do with social media <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to lead. I'm trying to lead him in a direction here. Yeah, you always try and do that. Okay, so it depends on the channel. Um, if it's uh, Facebook, I've almost entirely stopped using it as a social platform to engage with friends. I don't really. I used to post a lot of pictures and stuff up. It's really good for you know grandparents, my mum and dad. They you know they live in Ireland, so it was really good for them to like see what's going on with the kids and you know. It's, stuff like that and i don't know it was a novelty but i just don't really do that anymore i just the only stuff i tend to be post is uh stuff about either bitcoin or like the shows i've made and i don't really i i am kind of edging towards i'll probably get rid of my facebook at some point over the next year because I, I just don't really need it uh instagram's very similar now i pretty much don't do the same with that uh, LinkedIn is an absolute shit show, so um, that is purely work. And Twitter, Twitter's a bit, you know, Twitter's the one I actually like. I like Twitter for, yes, it's for marketing. Of course it's for marketing. But I also actually, you learn a lot from it. You, you get introduced to lots of different bits of interesting content from it. Like I wouldn't have met you, Shinobi or Janine, if it wasn't for Twitter. And both of you I've learned a lot from in different ways. So uh, tw Twitter's the one I probably will keep. I could see me getting rid of Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn, though. But just on a more abstract level, you see the kind of like dichotomy here. Either you're on one side of trying to project content to a wide audience or consume it from somebody who is doing so, or you're just trying to have small, more personal communications in a much smaller scale. Like, you know what I mean? Well, I think you can, you can do both. So... Why do you have to go to some place like Twitter for that? I mean, isn't there other ways that you can blast <clears throat> like information to a wide group on the internet? <clears throat> like if you're just trying to interact with a small group of people, aren't there a lot more private, closed ways to do that? 
Uh, not not that I know of. No, but, but Twitter's really useful. Um, it, you know, you can build yourself up a big audience. You know, I've nearly got 100,000 followers. That's really good for promoting content. Um, and, you you know, you, you use it yourself. It's also fun. I'll just be honest. Twitter's just a lot of fun. I like the amount of times I'm on there and I'm just fucking laughing my head off. Um, I don't know. I just really enjoy Twitter. All right. Let's talk about podcasting now. Any <laughs> tangents. Let's do it. Shinobi. All right, Peter, what what do you really think about over the last couple of years has been the thing changing how you interact with, with content creation? Like what, what are, what are the biggest factors that have made you really rethink how you do that? Well, there was that time I was, I know you've asked this question. I was sat on a plane in Boston about to fly to New York to catch a plane to Hong Kong. And I announced I was going to do an interview with Peter Risen, and Shinobi started a shitstorm. And I was like, "What?" And then, like, we started arguing, and we didn't know each other at the time. And I was, um, yeah, you know, I was throwing some shit back at you. And then, yeah, you know, caught the flight, got to New York, and it carried on. And then I got the flight to Hong Kong, but there was no Wi-Fi on the flight. It was a fifteen-hour flight. I got off the plane, like, switched on my phone, and it, it's like meltdown. Just, you know, when the alerts come through, it was, it's insane. I wish I could have videoed it because there was a shitstorm on Twitter. There was DMs. There was emails. And, and you know, some people absolutely supporting Shinobi's view that I should not be doing any work promoting or, or speaking to people about shitcoins or people who are scammers. But there were a bunch of other people who also, the other side, you know, were very supportive and said, no, you should speak to anyone you want, blah, blah, blah. But what it did make me do is I, like, I did have a serious sit down and reflect upon it and i was like you know actually you're right well, i should just focus on bitcoin there's a lot to be you know for on a personal level let's just let's break it down the different things so firstly on a personal level it's very good for me to focus on bitcoin to keep it utterly simple also actually i kind of came to the realization that all these other coins are absolutely dumb i've lost a lot of me on them um and I guess I just had a kind of whole shift in the way I wanted to approach things. I'm, it was awful at the time, but I'm really glad it happened. Yeah, believe it or not, uh, we've all been on the other end of Shinobi shitstorms at one point or another. I heard a rumor that he's been on the end of one of yours as well. Oh, uh, really? What kind? I don't know, but somebody said to me that you called him out on something on Block Digest. I can't remember what it was. I heard, I, mean, I heard that Shinobi actually got something wrong. I mean, we call each other out all the time. It's called fact-checking. <laughs> i tell you the other thing that's been, it's been uh, really important in terms of content creation is uh, sticking absolutely to my un, uh, uh, like immovable position of keeping everything as simple as possible and really kind of pushing the fact that uh trying to help people like shinobi understand there are, are other people who are nothing like him you know so we had me and matt had the big debate about x pubs and the reality is i still don't know what one is i know i know kind of what it is but I, I don't know how i interact with it i don't know how i use it and i kind of i don't really care and i think about a good, good 99 percent of people who use bitcoin maybe more really don't care either you know, funny thing is, I actually, despite all the shit I give you about stuff like that, completely agree, Peter. Um, I just think you, at this point, <laughs> should be able to start figuring all this out. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, there really is just a wild overestimation of competence and ability to deal with the tools in this space. And, I mean, that's a big part of where... I kind of think in terms of content, like I am not the best person in the world at breaking things down that simply. So I think more in terms of break things like that down for the people who can get it so they can go on and break it down for people who can't. Like I, I literally had to spend an hour um, the other day just walking a friend through moving his coins with Electrum on a cold card to a new word seed. And it took an hour just to explain how to import an Electrum file, open that file, get a receive address, sign from the other wallet, and move it. And explain 
all the different functions in that wallet. Like it, it took me an hour to walk somebody through making a single transaction. Yeah, some of this stuff's tricky. Also, I, I just before I forget, I'll, I'll bring something up that uh, Janine also said once that really stuck with me when I was going through one of my UX rants, and I think you were on Tales from the Crypt, and I think that's when I reached out to you, Janine, because you said something on there where you said, actually, I, I, I'll get this wrong, you, you can remind me um, what it was exactly, but you said something along the lines of, the thing is, if it's really quite difficult to use you have to be very careful you have to take some time but if you make ux too easy you actually make it easier for people to make stupid mistakes and I, that really stuck with me and i think about that a lot actually yeah let's talk yep. you're a ux expert also i'm told i'd like to hear you talk about the balance i mean one of the first things i was taught when i was studying ux back in london years ago was that the user exists in your head that's what the instructor was you know, wanted to convey is that you know we all talk about like making things user friendly and if you work in startup world, you know what that's like. It's almost a daily conversation. But he emphasized, look, the user is in your head. And one of the, the trickiest issues you have with security products is that you have foot guns, right? It's like you just described, is that, yeah, if you make, there's a balance to be struck. It turns out money is hard. Global settlement policy comes at a cost. We've been so drugged up on these sort of bubblegum UIs delivered by Silicon Valley, everything's supposed to be easy and, and convenient, that when we're actually exposed to the bare metal, like with Bitcoin, we see all the moving parts, it's kind of ugly, but it's real. And that's that's the physics right there that you're staring at in the face. What sort of balance do you think needs to get struck? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of break that down in a few ways. So the first really interesting thing with it all, just because of this, is that when you talk like Shinobi was talking then about having his friend, you know, this is money, but the money is actually files and pieces of kind of like data. Whereas I don't think people think of money like that. They think of money as this like physical thing. And even when they're spending their credit card, I still think in your head, you're imagining, you know, pounds and or dollars in notes and being moved around. I just think in your head, it's because when you're using Bitcoin, it is actually pure just code. And it is you know, technology, and that is a beat for people to get their head around. In terms of the UX, so just as a background, like I'd spent nearly 20 years uh, running web agencies, you know, just standard web web builds. Um, my first, well, not my first, but one of my first jobs was UX. I used to be a planner. So you know, when a client would come in, uh, give an example, it might be something like Virgin Active, so a group of gyms, and they wanted you know websites for their customers to be able to sign up, book lessons, et cetera, et cetera. And the best book I ever read on UX is by Steve Krug. It's called Don't Make Me Think. And the idea being is that you know, interfaces should be really easy and simple to use. So there are certain things, like really basic things. Like, so for example, you may design a, a, an interface for a homepage on uh, Photoshop and, and the designer might be using a really kind of uh, a high resolution screen. and when that gets translated into web design, where they put the button maybe to sign up, is that they don't actually understand the user's browser and it might go off screen. So the user's on, the, on that screen and they don't actually see that button, which is the one you want them to press. So what really interesting is I, I actually worked on a startup once. There's a, a really cool website called usertesting.com. And all you do is you go onto that and you, you know, sign up 10 people and you set them tasks. So it might be, you know, register or it might be book a class and you ask them to talk as they're doing things and it's amazing to go through that experience and watching people actually use something you've created and see the things they get stuck with it'd be really interested to do that with some you know bitcoin interfaces but i obviously really wanted you know all the bitcoin interfaces to be kind of like you know that bubblegum design uh, sf thing you've talked about silicon valley and it, it was when janine talked about that i was like okay no that's actually that is a really good point um but i still think that comes down to good ux it doesn't have to be bubblegum design you can make something really easy to use while at the same time making people understand the responsibility of, of the tool so for example i think a, a very very good tool in terms of ux uh, despite what's happened to them recently is the ledger live interface so strip out all the fact that it's shit coins or whatever um and if you just use it purely for bitcoin it's a really easy hardware device to use it's a really easy interface to use but at the same time 
it, it takes you through the steps of responsibility. So, for example, if you want to uh, have a send address, it appears on your uh, device. You have to double check it. Things like that. They've, they've managed to create something that's really easy to use, but at the same time, making sure you, you check each stage and you make sure you follow each stage uh, and, 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 and don't make any kind of like stupid mistakes. But it is a, like, look, it's a tough balance to strike. Yeah, I mean, uh, that kind of makes me tempted to record myself every time I have to, rec even to receive a wire transfer, the kind of words that come out of my, I'm just swearing constantly every time I use a bank account, a regular bank account. Like Bitcoin to me is so much easier Right. <laughs> that I, I'm like amazed that anyone's able so, to, use, I mean, the, the new, like, like the Neo bank apps, those are slightly better but regular bank accounts like if you have a credit union or something you are if you don't know how to use them you're screwed like i don't know what numbers to use <laughs> or anything still to this day so let, let's just talk i want to come back on that so let's just talk about expectations so so technology drives technological advancement um which is largely driving social change also uh drives uh user expectations right the more advanced we get with our technology the more expectations rise in in perceptions of the users and context matters if you're like Janine and you're a digital native and you you know you don't remember life before the internet life before Wait, no wrong well well so, almost but pretty much okay, no, no, no. Wait, maybe let me stop you, you personally Wait. But to other people. <laughs> chris chris stop okay so i'm because you know peter brought up the whole thing about girl the dragon tattoo i'm about to like completely implode your image of me so i uh, uh, like a little over a decade ago i got my own computer that was a little over a decade ago before that i had only used computers that were basically shared access so home library school um up until that point never had my own computer unless you count a phone i did have a phone many years ago I don't use it for anything really, but so this image that people have of me that I'm like some kind of super spy is kind of bunk because I had no special introduction or upbringing that put me where I am today, where I am today over the past 10 years, which is less amount of time than Bitcoin has even existed. I have just spent a lot of time learning as much as possible. And I'm still nowhere close to where I think I should be, but. Okay, like... sorry, I didn't mean to use you as an example. Maybe not the correct example. I just mean that different different expectations. If you are a digital native, then of course you're going to respond better to uh, banks like N26, which have a native, natively mobile. They don't even have branches at all, um, more than just direct banking. But if you're older, uh, like my parents, you know, they can get out by fine with, you know, one of these old fashioned sat navs with that sort of basic UI that they were used to just because they're more familiar with it. And I think likewise with with Bitcoin, it, it was proven to us in the 2000 financial crisis that outsourcing your finance uh, to other people is just not a good idea because finance is all about about the future it's about the way we relate to our dreams and when you give that over to somebody else there better be some really rigorous checks on corruption because if not they're going to find ways to steal from you and so then it was like okay well let's go back to basics we formed bitcoin and it was much more nuts and bolts it was a combinatorial innovation it didn't create anything new it just put a bunch of existing technology together and said how about we do it like this instead but it didn't give you the bells and whistles it didn't give you the SF UIs. And as so, yeah, I mean, if, I, if you go to someone like Peter Todd or even people like me and Shinobi and show us a bubblegum wrapper, we'll just be like, ooh, how do I use this thing? Like, I don't even know how to use some of these things because I'm much more familiar with like a command line environment. And like Peter Todd actually once said to me, like, he doesn't know how to use these fancy apps either. You know, just like people that use fancy apps don't know how to use command lines. So I think it, it is about context but the, my problem my conjecture actually to you peter is that silicon valley is largely a cult and it's it's driving uh behavioral change in fact they even use the nudge which comes out of chicago originally nudging right as a form of behavioral economics as a way of steering people's actions they're not interested in educating people about their money and getting under the hood and seeing how it works what they're really interested in doing is controlling the actions of the user which i think is my conjecture is antithetical bitcoin in its origins mm -hmm. 
that that's kind of my biggest problem with <clears throat> that type of user experience is that it's not trying to just open a toolkit for users. It's trying to just guide them through pre-programmed specific actions. And I just do not like that user interface. But, you, you know, I, I think really like a core like point though, um, in terms of the divide you just broke down, Chris, is really, I don't like, I'd say that that difference in familiarity with technology is a big part of it. But I think a, a bigger part is the anxiety that there's no take backs. And so even with a relatively simple user interface or a user experience, like there's just that worry that didn't exist before of I can't take anything back. And then another part is the abstracting away what a UTXO is. Like I think okay. that is the but before biggest you even mistake. get there. Before you even get to that though, I mean you use the term takesy backsies. I mean, there is no fucking backspace on life. Like get over it, people. You're you're interfacing with money, even in the banking system. We had lots of arguments with, you know, these consultants that were coming in. If you remember when they were all these banking people were trying to get in on blockchain, it's the underlying technology, we were told. And they said, Look, the banking system takes you backsies. If you make a mistake, we'll get the money back. And I had to point it out to people that that's actually only true for Visa and MasterCard and PayPal because they don't give you settlement finality. They give they exchange IOUs over their own network. Work. If you do a bank transfer in the United Kingdom or in SEPA, I only am familiar with the UK and Europe, in SEPA or the faster payments, there isn't, you've got to take the other person to court to get that back. So there, there isn't, even in the banking system, there's no taxi backies. Yeah, but most most people are used to dealing with like the card processors though. You know what I mean? Like most people's interaction with money is in some way where they have a take back option or a but safeguard. Then, you're dealing Guys. with an abstraction. You're dealing with Guys. an abstraction. Let Peter talk. Yeah, Peter, go. Well, you need me. You need to leave me with a question. Well, I, I gave <laughs> you some conjecture about different contexts for different users, and you know that you know certain technology. You know, there's trade offs to be made. If you use something like Ledger, yes, you're going to get a more intuitive experience if you're used to that style of UI, but you're giving up some control. So it's a spectrum. Was, was my conjecture. And it was the question really around balance. No, I, I completely agree. I just think there's a, a massive reality with this is, is what people are comfortable using and what people will use, and you know what what people's expectations are for kind of what their life is. So whilst we're in our Bitcoin bubble and you know surrounded by people of different levels of uh, uh, let's say political ideology, you know. For libertarianism, for anarchism, and etc. There's a lot of people actually very happy living in a society with a government, whether we like it or not. And these same people are very happy uh, uh, to pay taxes. And you know, this is these are the same people who are probably very happy just to buy Bitcoin and see it go up, and don't care too much about the, these these kind of privacy tools and, and technologies, and kind of just want something easy to use. Uh, they, these are people you're not going to get off Facebook. You're not going to get them off there. Uh, iPhones, they're just going to continue doing what, what they're going to do. And this is, this is something I've always tried to bring into the uh, Bitcoin conversation, despite regularly being told I'm a cuck and a, uh, and a statist, is that like there is, there, is, there is a vision of the world that some people have, and then there's the kind of reality of what people are living in. You know, people are busy. They're trying to you know, raise their kids. They're trying to go to work and some money. And I just don't think a lot of people have time to come home and, and think, right, do you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect all my social media channels. I'm I'm going to get rid of my iPhone. I'm going to get Bitcoin. I'm going to go off. I just think it's we're, we're so far away from that. And therefore, when you think about UX and, and tools, you know, I, th I think the only way you're ever going to have mass adoption of uh, privacy or, or, or mass caring about privacy is through technology. And, and I actually think I had a conversation with Fluffy Pony once and he said, you need someone like Apple to care. You need it baked into the biggest products in the market for it to actually, actually matter to people. Well, the assumption there is that you're, you're trying to get mass user adoption and just point out that not every Bitcoiner wants that. But yeah, I agree with you that if, uh, if your goal is mass adoption, then you would have to adapt to the users. Well, for example, with Taproot, um, I mean, any privacy tool, you need 
I mean, I don't know if you need mass adoption, but you do need broad enough adoption that the the anonymity set is actually large enough for it to give you any that feature in the first place. Like Taproot needs to be adopted by enough people for it to provide, you know, the kind of resistance against chain analysis. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't think that users necessarily. Um, uh, I don't think it's true that users don't necessarily care about um, privacy. I think there's a broad awareness of privacy issues, and the fact that some of these are even being brought up by governments themselves. They're setting up committee hearings talking about data breaches. But on the other hand, at that point, of course, governments are invested um, in in route more and more surveillance. That's just the trajectory we're on. And what we might see is a fitness function of the mass populace feeling that people, most people, end up becoming enslaved, especially when all these new digital currencies come out by these central banks. I think that the the strategy now as it would appear is to actually not just do away with this sort of shadow banking and that the you know the exchanges and all the betting shops it's also to do away with banks themselves i think a lot of central bankers would just prefer it if all the, the currencies in the world were just digital all controlled by central banks cut out the middlemen completely and that way you can roll out basic universal income you can just give people rations uh, tax everyone at source you never have to tax return again you know like all your money's just when you're paid they can see everything that you do they can control the inflation perfectly without all these you know sort of messiness and and actually peter that really that gives those iphone users exactly what they want they they just they would rather someone just did it all for them um they just want to get on with the dopamine hits and and response but if, you, if you're into bitcoin you probably you're probably not too interested in that stuff you know yeah, I guess it really depends on it, what people actually want. Do they want to help and liberate individuals to 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 live a more private uh, life and a you know the the kind of life that perhaps people like uh, Janine and, and Shinobi live with is kind of off grid or, or you know is that what it's about or do people actually really want to fundamentally change the structure of society and governance? I think a lot of people want to do the latter, and there's a lot of talk of you know Bitcoin fixes this and. You know, you know, advising people to read the sovereign individual, individual, and tell us where the world's going. Kind of like to talk about if that's going to happen. How does how does that happen, and what are the consequences of it? Because I think they're really important topics to discuss. Because do you know, the transition away from the state is quite a big thing. <laughs> um, uh, can it happen? I think it's unlikely. Will it happen? Uh, who knows? What are the consequences of this? I'm actually. That's where, that's an area like, like I find fascinating. But can I challenge you on that? Because the, the assumption seems to be that the states. I mean, I've heard this argument before. Um, uh, the real Satoshi, whatever Craig Wright, whatever you guys call him, he's um, you know he's fond of saying that governments aren't going anywhere, right? So that this is a fate to compli, that, that we're just left with them. But actually, governments are rather an aberration. The way that we have them today, you know, post Westphalia, this kind of you know sort of action that we've done in the last sort of uh, century or so of just state build exercises i mean these states are large but they face the same physical reality that smaller groups have faced for centuries and millennia and i don't know that they're all that sustainable i mean just look at the state of these economies right now look at all the the, the, the these trade agreements we've chosen to do reciprocal bargaining between states through diplomacy but only because otherwise you end up with war so we want it to be you know more profitable to trade apparently markets uh, drive down that the incentive for war but it just creates a different style of conflict as we've seen with this rise of populism and new dealers that are coming into power we just had trump we've had you know other other people like you know in india and brazil and britain with uh with bojo um and so you're seeing that but i think the reason my conjecture would be the reason we're seeing this rise is because it's a, it's a cry out for localism Pe- people want power locally because localism is where the practical you know physical reality is and if you do have these big top-down hierarchies uh, the, the intention of the of the leaders has to go all the way down the chain of command if any of that fucks up then they don't they don't get the you know we saw with covid like what you want at a larger scale is you want coordination but you, what you want at a local scale is deliverable action, right? I just don't, I don't know if I agree with you that the state is somehow, that's it. We, we've, we've arrived, you know, that these big, huge nation states like Germany, France, this is, this is it. This is how we govern the human population. I think there are alternatives, much smaller, more federated governments. No, I actually, no, I actually agree with you on that point as well. Um, and I myself am considering... At some point in the future, I don't think I'll be living in the UK. I think I just want to go and live somewhere a little bit quieter. 
uh, a, a little bit kind of like a little bit stress-free um hopefully some island somewhere where it's always sunny um and i think we're it's quite interesting to see what's happening in the u.s at the moment this kind of like regulatory uh migration that you're seeing like people being drawn to miami or or being drawn to Wyoming because of the regulatory environment. I and it was a really interesting point that Balaji made to me. He said that the you know, voting with your feet is actually much more effective than the ballot. Um, you can you can try and vote for change. You usually don't get it, but if you just move, that's going to have a greater impact. So I think we're seeing some of those kind of ideas around localism. What I'm saying is like this vision of of living in a in like a, with these huge countries like the US that we wouldn't have a state. I just it's not to say it can't be achieved. I'm just interested to how how that plays out. How do people think that will play out? Um, well, you say this. Well, just sorry, one more thing. You say the state isn't sustainable, um, but is the Chinese state sustainable? I don't obviously like the Chinese state, but they've had a, a, a very successful last couple of decades in expanding their reach globally, and also as potentially other like the U.S. state becomes potentially weaker is, is that actually a dangerous situation if you look at the belt and road in- initiative and the amount of investment that china's made all across the world especially in uh, coastal cities around uh, coastal cities in countries around africa you know is there a is there a bigger danger there by not at least having uh, a, a more let's say compared to the chinese state the u.s state's more uh, uh, democratic do you not need a strong U.S. to to fight against uh, uh, the the growth of the Chinese state? Well, historically, well, I mean, that's... historically, that it, it's always been dangerous when two empires come head to head. But I think what you're describing with the Belt and Road is really what you're you're what you're drawing attention to is a good strategic move by China, rather than evidence that China is necessarily growing in its political authority. Because I think that for for that kind of empire to, to take over, like. I actually don't think they have the same kind of expansionist agenda that, that America has, the same way that America goes there dropping, you know, democracy onto other uh, nations and stuff. But it has a different style of expansionism. And I do think it's threatened. So I think we should be concerned about it. But I don't think we should be confusing good strategy with necessarily a, a sign that they're rising in terms of their dominance and longevity. Well, I mean, it's like to recontextualize all of this. Like one of the most important predictions in the sovereign individual was the neo Luddite revolution. Like the, the entire book is about the the freeing of capital as more and more of it digitizes and that creating jurisdictional arbitrage. And obviously, um, well off nation states are going to get very nationalistic and very isolationist and and restrictive in that kind of environment because, hey, they can't just peel off whatever they want from everything anymore because if they go out like overboard, they go out of bounds with that, they're just going to leave. And I mean, that's kind of the exact dynamic going on in the United States for more than a decade now is just capital migrating outward and that causing more and more instability in terms of America itself. I mean, like it, that is exactly the kind of trends that push things towards localization. Like the capital is fleeing, government gets more and more uh, abusive and predatory, trying to suck resources out of people, so they leave. And this just buckles the entire national structure and inevitably forces things to localize more. And, you know, read China. I mean, I, I kind of disagree with you there, Chris. I think they're doing exactly what america has done just more strategically they are economically colonizing the third world effectively and a lot of places in africa are catching on and really not okay with that i mean like they just had us do it and then china comes in trying to play the same hand i i don't think that'll go as well as it did for us yeah, let me just jump in. So I've had this argument locally as well with with friends, and I think you're you're correct. It's a different type of 
of expansionism because actually, I got some pushback here in Berlin. We have a lot of communist sympathizers, and I'm not even joking here. And and they they usually want to defend um, China, and I, I sort of had to send them links and evidence of what I was saying. And it's not a military expansion, but it's as you say, it's an economic expansion, similar to what the US does with Fedwire. Um, you know, it basically controls the, the global monetary system because of the petrodollar, and so it's able to exert its force and its political influence on on other countries and i think china has has done that but i I, i'm i am concerned i don't want to see um the expansion of an empire like china um into my livelihood but but peter brings up a good point that we are a migratory species you said it as well and and i think a vote with feet is probably way more power than a vote at, at a ballot box at the moment why are we talking about china because it's relevant in context of things i know but like it like god this this episode has the most tangents that i've <laughs> that's my fault peter so um how do you feel about not explaining what a utxo is in relation to anxiety dealing with bitcoin from a user experience point of view because i i personally think that that notion um really kind of throws people for a loop when they don't have just a simple pay or receive button i mean i i still don't fully understand utxos themselves um when i use a wallet it has a total balance and when i receive bitcoin that number goes up and when i send bitcoin that number goes down that's, that's and that that is for me the user experience i want i want a total and i want to be able to send and receive that's, that's all i need i don't have coin control uh, i don't really fully understand how utxos work but I'm kind of okay with that. I think I think it's far more important to teach people about uh, economics and why they should care about Bitcoin rather than trying to push them down the technical rabbit hole of understanding all these things such as UTXOs and XPubs and ZPubs and Taproots. I just I, I don't think in the broadest, broader uh, environment it's as important. It's much more important to teach people about the reality of what goes on with central banking and the macro economy and and things like that and i think that's far more important so it's a bit like a bit like driving a car then so you, you don't need to know how a car works you just need to know that it works and you understand it as a user maybe you know how to change the oil but you wouldn't necessarily know how to fix it is that what you mean kind of yeah i mean look there are some people when they've got a problem with their car like my my father he he'll you know he can tinker with it he can fix certain issues and then there's people like me if i've got a problem i'll take it to the garage so with regards to bitcoin um I I use it exactly as I need. If I had a problem that I needed some help with, I would go to Shinobi and say, "Look, dude, how do I do this?" And I'm sure Shinobi would help me. But I don't feel it's a necessity. It's a necessity for everybody who's using Bitcoin to fully understand the deep technical uh, details of it. It it it, it is far more complicated for certain people than than people realize. Uh, I mean, I just say for me, it just personally on my own level, right? Um, as Janine said, I'm a marketing guy, but marketing comes easy for me. You know, if, if you said to me, Pete, how do we get, um, you know, triple our listenership for Block Digest? I could, within an hour, I could tell you how to do it and, and it would work, right? Uh, that comes naturally to me. You can explain an XPUB to me in about within probably two or three hours. I just don't understand it again. Uh, and I, I can't explain why that is. I just, that's the makeup of me. And it's not for a lack of trying. I just, I just know what, where my strengths and weaknesses are. It's a bit like when I had my agency, right? I first started as a programmer. I learned HTML. Okay, that was fine. I could program websites. Then I tried to learn JavaScript and I just could not understand. I couldn't get it. I could not understand how scripting worked. I couldn't. So I, I ended up becoming a UX designer and then a planner because that's what I, that's what worked for me. And that's just, it's just a reality of where we are. And I, I keep banging the drum and it pisses people off, but like I stand by it. No, but that's the, the point though, Peter, is like, that's like, I don't consider a UTXO a deep technical thing. Like that's like understanding that four quarters add up and can get you a dollar. Like that, that is a really important thing. And that, that is an economic thing because like, for instance, let's say you're a guy who buys 20 bucks of Bitcoin every week and you immediately withdraw that 20 bucks of Bitcoin to your wallet and the price starts going up. And now you want to go spend that money on some large purchase. The amount of fees you are going to pay are massive 
And they're just going to compound and get way worse depending on what fee market conditions are like because you have a shit ton of small value UTXOs. And if you don't understand what a UTXO is, that will cost you money in the future. Like that is actually an economic cost incurred because you didn't understand what a UTXO was and you didn't manage that properly to minimize the amount of fees that you have to pay. And it's also a security risk because how you manage those UTXOs can leak information to any number of people observing the blockchain or that you interact with. Yeah, that's why I, I would say, look, that's, um, that just needs to be solved in design. Someone needs to solve that in design. So it, that's just, it's just done for you. It's like if I have, um, let's think of money as it is. If I have a pocket full of change and notes and I go into a store and I've got to buy something, it doesn't matter what I'm buying. I don't pay an additional fee for the combination of uh, notes and coins I use. I just pay. Similarly, if I pay on my credit card, I just pay, and the fee itself is a fixed percentage. I'm not saying that Bitcoin should be redesigned, but there is just like a, a reality of that. That if if you showed me a wallet and explained to me how UTXOs work, I could I could draw on a piece of paper and say, okay, this is how you would want to do that in terms of UX to make it easier for, easier for people to understand. But at the moment, I don't. I think it's I think we're a long way from people wanting to or want going to care about that. They want to spend an amount. They see a total of Bitcoin. They want to make a transaction. They want to send some Bitcoin, and they just want everything done in the background. Now, would if you, if there are ways of like changing the fees or so, uh, you're improving it, wouldn't it be great if it said, okay, we're going to use this these combination of UTXOs? But then I would be thinking, well, what you really then need is some kind of walkthrough to explain UTXOs for people at the start. Um, but I th all these kind of things to me just need to be solved in UX. I just want to push back on you a little bit there where you said that there's no transaction fee for using coins versus credit card. Actually, that's not true. You, you spend in terms of your time. Um, and it will, obviously, if you're a merchant, you do end up paying um, quite a lot in, in fees when you have uh, lots of tills full of pennies and, and five pence. And in Sweden, for example, you can't even deposit cash very easily anymore uh, either as a merchant or as a, an end user you have to go to specialist drop-off points and you i think sometimes you even have to pay an actual fee for processing credit card companies like visa and other retailers that i've worked with before actually promote the use of contactless payment because they say psychologically users don't quite think of scarcity of money in the same way when they're just tapping in they don't think about it they just tap it and sometimes they don't even look at the price and that way it's easier to get the velocity of money up in the economy because people are more willing to to spend their money so i push back a little bit on that and what so what do you think in, as well to, as a remedy what's wrong with the information hierarchy principles of just designing the uis so that they have the affordance of more advanced features should you be so inclined but then you know also just having like a, a standard um ui for for everybody else like you're describing so th this would be slightly embarrassing for me to ask this. Shinobi's going to shake his head and go, I can't believe you're asking this, Pete. But honestly, this is the, this is a very honest question. So like I say, when I use a wallet, I have a total amount of Bitcoin. And when I send, it just sends, right? Uh, so are you explaining, if, if you explain it to me, so in the background, say if, say if my wallet has you know, one Bitcoin in it, for example, is that made up of a combination of UTXOs, which all have different values? Yeah, they're like yes. coins. Yeah. Yeah, it's, balance. Just, it's like having coins in there. So, so really, in in some way, you you almost want to see that stack within the wallet. There you, you go. Want, he's coming round. You almost want to no, but you almost want to see, for example, okay, here's here's your list of uh, UTXOs. I, I would probably have renamed it in another way and say, uh, and you can order them in like size. So, okay, you've got one here which is a Bitcoin, and you've got another one which is two point two of a Bitcoin, and then all the way down to the ones you've got as like, you know blah 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 but also at the same time when you go to spend there should be a way of the wallet knowing which is the best combination of utxos to use there you go well you did it. that's that's pretty much how wasabi's uh user interface works you just see the utxos but that's like how do you automate um your wallet knowing that this utxo is what you buy weed with from your drug dealer and this utxo is what you paid your rent from last month and 
this UTXO is something you pay for your porn subscription on. So definitely don't use that for anything you're sending to mom. Like, how do you automate that? I've always felt like um, it would be really good if your wallet was just splitting. I think I had this conversation. Was it with you or somebody else? I said, it'd be really good if your wallet was just split into two wallets. One is your kind of private wallet and you know, one is your kind of public wallet for yourself. So one is the one you want to use all the coin for private things and one, you know, that you don't want anyone to know. And the one's more, a little bit more public. Um, but beyond that, I just think, I think a lot of people don't think like that. They're not going to think, right, I need to use this UTXO for weed because if it's just too complicated. We're already at a, a stage where we're lost. It's like, why? What's, what do you mean? I can't, use, I've already, have I not, you already use this UTXO? Which. So this is where I'm already getting confused. I'm like, okay, so I've got this point two one. What do you mean I can't use? Is it because when I use that UTXO, say if it's point two of a Bitcoin, I only want to spend point zero five. That what actually happens then from that UTXO? It's a bit of that, and then creates it's, new UTXOs. It's because you, if you connect the wrong two UTXOs together, then you've shown statistically the same person owns those. And if somebody can find out that's you. Like what what happens when you buy some weed off the dark market and then you take that same UTXO and pay your rent and whatever processor your landlord is using looks at that and finds that dark market spend and flags that and now uh oh you're in trouble. The fundamentally balances don't actually exist exist in bitcoin balances are something that wallets it's a way of the wallet representing to you what utxos are controlled by each address so yes. the balance you see in your ledger like your t i mean ledger i mean all the hardware wallets uh the interfaces they have multiple balances they usually show the total balance for your entire wallet so that's all utxos controlled by all the keys that can be generated by your mnemonic seed that you use to recover and such um, and then they usually show balances for each address if you generate multiple addresses, or they'll they'll show a balance actually for the accounts, and then sometimes the individual addresses as well. Um, but balances are all things that the wallet does. If you if you try to like search the Bitcoin blockchain for balance, like the balance doesn't fundamentally exist. You just have coins that are controlled. You essentially UTXOs are just coins, and Bitcoin, it's not like the US dollar or the euro where you have like 10 cent coins 20 cent coins you can have those but with bitcoin you can have basically a coin of any size and that's a utxo yes the utxo can be any any amount um that you want i mean when you make a transaction if you have you know half a bitcoin you only want to spend uh 0.25 then the change becomes a utxo that is whatever you didn't want to spend in the transaction yeah, it's a bit like your wallet. Your wallet doesn't have a balance in it. It just has a number of notes, and the balance is you yeah. totaling up. So you're like, oh, I've got a pound in my, my wallet. Um, so let me just ask you another thing about UTXO. So say if I've got this um, UTXO that is half a Bitcoin and I want to spend 0. 0.25, does it send – how does it actually work? Does it send that whole 0. 0.5 and then send me back 0.25? Yep. 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 Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so the – I mean, there's some wallets where it – like I think even Ledger, I mean, at least I know Trezor does, but a lot of the hardware wallet interfaces, they give you, well, kind of they do it kind of in a bad way. They don't show you the change. They don't show you that they actually generated a change output. It's just kind of happens in the background. And so if you want to spend that specific change, it's like impossible because they don't show it to you really as a separate change output. But you do obviously have the option when you send a transaction in these interfaces you can specify you know a second output address you don't want it to just generate a change address automatically but yeah that's what it does in the background is it generates a change address that is under the account that you're spending from and you don't really see that but obviously your balance reflects the fact that you still have that or output it's just at a different address than the original one let me ask you something as well so say janine i wanted to send you 20 bitcoin and when i do that it has to create that 20 bitcoin out of like i don't know 45 different utxos and it builds up and it sends it to you when you receive it do you then just receive a single utxo worth 20 yes. bitcoin 
or do you receive all the, you don't receive all the little yeah ones? i mean if you if you if you created a transaction where you're combining all of the utxos when you send it then yes that basically creates a a 20 dollar utxo a single one at my end Think so, of a so transaction basically... like smelting down any arbitrary amount pieces of gold you have and being able to cast that into any arbitrary amount of gold pieces that you can with whatever you smelted. Like that that's pretty much how UTXOs work. Okay. So the problem you're then saying is Shinobi is that say I've got this 0.5 UTXO and I wanted to buy some weed off my dealer um and I also, from that same one, uh, send my mum some money. They can both be aware of that transaction happening by looking at the blockchain. Yeah, yeah. because when you because when you sign the transaction, you're basically saying I have the private key that controls these coins. And so, if you're spending those UTXOs together, you're saying I control both these UTXOs, even if they go off to different places. You can see in the in the history that they were once spent by the same person or at least the same key. So that means that you know very likely that one person owns them. And that's why Taproot is going to be interesting because Taproot is going to make it harder. Uh, when you send a transaction with Taproot, let's say you had a group of people and you had you know, some kind of multi-sig together. Um, you, uh, you all have shared access to mo this money with you know, Taproot in a multi-sig. And let's say you out of the group want to send money to your mom. When you send money to your mom, yeah, with Taproot, I mean, it kind of, if someone knows that you have, you're in this multi sig, they can probably guess that you might have been one of the people who sent that transaction, but it could have been any of those people. And Taproot actually makes it look like a single signature. So you don't know whether it's a multi sig or a group of people. So that that's why it helps with privacy is that it kind of, it it obscures who is you know jettering the trans trolling the coins or who's you know initiating the transaction, whether you're in a group or just a person, a single person. Can can you hear me still? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I, I I guess these things are all things I would think just should be solved in in UX. I I, I get like someone like Shinobi or yourself, Janine, and such. You, you this all makes sense for you, and you know what you're doing, and you're going to manage it in a very careful way a lot of people are, are, i think would find it one confusing and are likely going to make mistakes so wouldn't it be great if um maybe if your wallet had a link every um every time you receive bitcoin you have a choice if you'd want to coin join that or not and if you coin joined it it went into the coin join wallet and if you didn't it went into the other one and then maybe all of those kind of like sketchy purchases that you want to make that you want to keep hidden that are spent from the coin join wallet I don't know if that makes it, if you if you understand like what I'm yeah. proposing there, but but I would solve it in and and you know I would solve it like that. Yeah, I mean that's it's basically a question of like can you make the wallet smart enough to make those kinds of decisions? Um, and I think, I think you need to. I, I, I just yeah. just for the majority of people to have something like this. I, I also, there's, there's there's the lazy side to it as well. People, I think other some people are also lazy. Um, I've no doubt that I've completely screwed all my Bitcoin privacy. Everything is just a mess myself. But if somebody introduced me to a new wallet and they said, okay, this new wallet, needs, oh, every incoming transaction, you have a choice to coin join it. You just press a button and go, yep, I do. Great. And off it goes and coin joins it. And, um, or if I said no, it went into the other wallet. And then I, at least I know it's like, okay, I've got two wallets here. Because the, the reason not to coin join it, I guess, is the cost, right? So there's certain ones that I don't want to spend the money on the coin join. It's not worth it because I, I have certain transactions I'm happy to do. Um, but I guess some people would want to coin join everything. Well, it's also can you? Um, like, you know, coin join protocols, um, some of them have like minimum requirements of how much you can mix. And then there's also, you know, security concerns of, well, if something's doing that, then your key is active in your wallet and signing something based on automatic logic all the time. So do, do you really want all of your coins stored in something like that? Like in, in some way, no matter how streamlined it is or how, how much the user interface holds the user's hand, on some level, people have to start understanding and thinking in terms of UTXOs 
or no matter how you come at it, you're creating costs for them or risks for them. Like you, um, that has to that, meet in the middle education and a good user interface. Like it, you can't just rely on one. Yeah. That kind of gets me to one of the questions I wanted to ask. Cause you've said a number of times that you purposely, you know, you, you try to keep things at, in terms of, you know, the knowledge or the amount of detail at a level that you think your audience will understand. How do you make decisions about where, like, how do you choose to limit your own knowledge uh, over, you know, actually gaining knowledge yourself so that, you know, you're improving and you're learning along the way. But if that outpaces your audience, like, how do you make those decisions? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I purposely don't uh, educate myself sometimes on certain things that uh, that you probably think I should. And but let me explain why. So I I see my show as like the 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 entry point, the catch all for anyone who wants to find out a bit about Bitcoin. Um, it's, I, you know, it's, it's, if I it's, it's a good example, if someone messages me and asks me about nodes, I'm like go and check out Stefan's Ministry of Nodes. If they ask me about like more technical stuff, I'm like go and listen to Marty's show or Stefan's or you know whatever. I like push in other directions. But at the t- if I started if my content started becoming like that, it it it's no longer the entry point for for new people coming in. It's no longer that basic introductory show. So I keep it like that by design, and I and I'll never change it. Plus, I what I what I also try and do is I try and be the average user. I actually try and be that person. I try and play as that person. So I'm not kind of so I so I'm I don't start to forget about the difficulties I had. Now that might sound like lazy or you know, people might think, what are you doing, Pete? You really need to learn this stuff. But like, I don't want to be that guy. I, I want to be the one that's completely empathetic to what people are struggling with when getting into Bitcoin. And, and and I don't think I'll ever change change it from that. Um, so that probably makes you, you're probably all shaking your head going, oh, what is he doing? But like, that is the design. Well, I mean, like at some point, like Pete, people who come in this space need to start grappling in some way with some of these issues or you know you're gonna have people go why the hell is that fee so big like why did five percent of my wealth just disappear or wait a minute why the hell am i getting this letter um and my bank account's getting shut down like if if people don't on some level understand these things better and find tools that make them easier together then like that's going to cause problems for people yeah it's you know what it's, it's a fair point and actually you know my own defense you know you're coming on my show now once a month we've agreed that because i i kind of come to that realization that i do need to understand this a bit more or, or at least uh push it a little bit more and i think what's likely going to happen is over the next year i'm going to I am going to kind of improve my skills. I am going to uh, spend more time understanding this stuff. And what, but the way I'll likely present it is in the most basic, easy step by step way. So, for example, I'll probably put together a, you know, a, uh, a beginner's guide to Bitcoin tech, you know, and I'll make a show about UTXOs and I'll make one about X clubs and just but, but super simple and say, look, these are the basics that you need to understand and just try and point people to just start having a look and share my own experience so to say I, I i fix myself in that position actually it's not entirely true because i kind of am recognizing that it's a really difficult balance to strike i'll be honest you know there are times i'm like i should be a lot more technical but then i i just go by the emails and the dms i receive and honestly some of them are, are incredible how basic the questions are you know, i had one the other day where somebody was like um, i think i told you this shinobi Somebody come on, uh, send me a, a message saying um, they've learned about not key, not your keys, not your Bitcoin, and they want to take it off uh, an exchange. Is BlockFi the right wallet for them? So they had literally no <laughs> they had no idea that that is just like a, 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 a still a not your keys, not your Bitcoin thing. But I just mm-hmm. I think I think what I really need to do is like get into my head. What are all the what are all the most important things technically people should learn about? Let's break them down into the most basic components and and. And then how can how can I help people learn about that? Um, I still think though I still think a lot of people are just are not going to have the. I mean, it takes a lot of time and dedication to really start understanding some of these topics and start using them. It is just right now just it's still very niche. 
I mean, I would definitely say UTXOs are a core place to start. No, well, I think I think you should talk about why you shouldn't use BlockFi, Peter. <laughs> BlockFi, awesome. <laughs> I, I have uh, I have a whole another Bitcoin because of BlockFi this year, so no, I, I I have no issue with BlockFi. I think a robust borrowing and lending market is is going to be important for Bitcoin, and I know why you got lot with not like Bitcoin, but uh, sorry BlockFi, but I actually quite like them. Why don't I, I like BlockFi? Like I think a couple of reasons. I think one, you wouldn't win because it's not your keys not your bitcoin if something goes drastically wrong then you're exposed and that's probably what you would think is for a, a low interest i think also secondly they you know they have been they had their own data issue where some of their data was exposed um uh, i think that's another reason why you might not like them but i've got an interesting kind of thought on the data i and i think it's something from lop said to me um also he tweeted about but actually what things like BlockFi and um, you know, the Ledger League taught me taught me is actually need to be better at using um, like fake data, like like un- like e- fake emails and fake phone numbers. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean that is definitely true. Um, the problem but... is a lot of service a lot of services like that. Uh, if you s- it depends on what kind of fake. Like if you if you're talking about like using you know, uh, a PO box, like a one that kind of appears as a res can appear as a residential address and they won't like flag it as being just a PO box. Um, a lot of services have a problem with that. But if you start entering fake, like, like the heavy KY stuff, like your, your name and things like that, they won't, you can't use them. You effectively can't fake data with these services unless you're super skilled, unless you're basically like a CIA person, like, uh, uh, someone at uh, well, he wasn't CIA. He was uh, he worked for the de- the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, you'd have to be someone like him to effectively fake data and still use services like this. Um, so that's that's an issue. Is that there's some service like the the ones where you can fake data. Um, I, we've been calling them KYC light because technically someone could come and they ask you for this information and you just give it to them and it's true and real. But if you wanted to, you could use fake data and you wouldn't you either wouldn't get kicked off the service automatically because either they don't care or they don't at least they don't care to notice. Those are KYC light. Um but a lot of services like BlockFi are not that. So it's very hard to fake data with these services. And so a big part of not your keys, not your coins is also the fact that the services that hold your coins a lot of the time they need <laughs> they need a lot of information on you um, for regulatory reasons, but also just because services like this like to have that information. They like to get that information for marketing purposes. The uh, something that the CEO said in the interview you gave is that you know they collected this information. He he kept blaming like the tax regulations. And he's like, yeah, we have to record this information in some way because of of taxes. But he also said they could have kept it offline and that would have been safe. Um, and the reason they didn't do that is because they didn't value the personal information of their customers enough. They didn't see it as a risk. Uh, a lot of these services don't see this personal information as being as sensitive as they should be treating as as their own customers Um should be treating it and often do they treat it they think it's sensitive they think they can trust these people um and then they don't (laughs) or they realize eventually they can't and then it's too late when they realize that um so yeah it's it's also quite tricky because like in some ways the the cat's out of the bag with data for a lot of people like myself I, i assume there is information on me everywhere it's majority has been hacked it's like it's almost like that reluctant. Oh, well, I'm just accept it's happened. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's, here's the latest hack. What are the things I can therefore do instead to protect myself? Um, in, in different ways, uh, th- there is that consideration. It's like, okay, can I can I have a blank slate? Right? Can I move house? Get a f- new phone number? Can I have a blank slate? Can I, can I get kind of in, in terms of data off grid? It's very difficult, especially if you're a parent with kids. You know, and you you know, running a business, and you have back you know bank account. Look, I'm not saying the tools aren't there to to eventually get there, but right now it is actually very difficult to be completely off grid. 
Um, I yeah, think no, it is. Us, yeah, yeah, and I think, and, and it takes a lot of work. A lot. I mean, you, you only have to go and read Lop's article about how he did it, and I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult. And there's plenty of times, like I have a little Lop who sits on my shoulder as well. There's plenty of times where I'm like, so for example, if I ever have to sign up for anything with an email uh, anywhere in public, if I'm in a restaurant and they, you know, they want your email address for their track and trace, whatever, whatever it is, I always put in a fake email now. I, I just make stuff up. Um, I continually do that. That's that's one thing I've done. But, you know, there's plenty of times where I'm like, what would Lop do here? And there's a lot of times I think there's actually times you can't get away with stuff. So, for example, uh, if I want to go and see my father who's in Ireland, I have absolutely no doubt I'm only going to be able to travel with a passport and proof of having taken a vaccine. I'm just not going to be able to away with that. Uh, and that's a shame, but I think that's just like a, a reality that we're in. And I kind of re- reluctantly accepted it. And I know that's sad, but I just don't know what else I can do. Yeah, I mean, traveling across borders with an ID that's yours is like super high level. I mean, the kind of thing that I'm hoping more people will do is that they're more careful about if they're going to use a custodian, they should be extremely careful who they choose. They should only give that custodian information that is actually required and nothing more. And ideally, they would just try, maybe not completely, but they should try to use as many services as possible where they don't have to give that kind of information. Like, that is a huge stepping point. Like, Lop even wrote a blog post about this. He said that the biggest privacy risk is just people giving their data to too many uh, trusted third parties. Like, if they just reduce that, um, maybe they can't stop doing it altogether, but if they they just reduce that as much as possible there would be far fewer issues like with this ledger thing i mean i don't trust these people i like i know that they're keeping records at, at, in some way and i know that they're probably not doing a good job of keeping it safe like all of them treasure you know <laughs> i don't know what they're doing now they might have changed their policies as like a marketing thing to say oh we're better than ledger now but pretty much all of them, they're keeping some kind of record. And so the way that I've did that is I've never, like I don't online shop very much, but I've especially never ordered a hardware wallet online. I've always gotten my devices in person. Um, and maybe that's something that a lot of people can't do, but I think they can if, I mean, a lot of these people go to conferences, a lot of these people go to meetups. Like I'm sure that there's they can find a way to not to give Ledger their exact address, their exact phone number, their exact email address. Because um, the only reason Ledger keeps that, I mean, you're you're not going to get in trouble for giving them the wrong information. I think a lot of people think that if they give fake data, in certain situations, they don't care. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, with With things like custodians, though, that do KYC because they're holding your keys, that's a different story because... If they find out later that you, you essentially, I mean, you, you lied to them, you gave them fake data, which is a kind of lying that I'm okay with because it protects, like it, it prevents someone from hurting you. Uh, and, you know, if, if, if they find that out, um, then they can just take your money. Like you could just you lose all of your coins, them like that. Like they control your keys. And effectively, they control your privacy as well. I think the thing is, you can manage something like this because you, I guess, are thinking adversarially the whole time. It's constantly something you're aware of and you're on top of things. For, for me to start thinking about like that, I've got to think, okay, first point, home address. Okay, I can move house. Okay, that's the starting point. Who has access to my address details? That, that's something I have to think about. And I can... You know, Put, have uh, security devices put on the house etc then i've got to think about okay my router okay what information am i leaking on my router right what privacy things i need to put in place on my router okay and then when i'm online what are the places i can leak data it's 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 almost an impossible task i think for most people that's why i think a lot of people just reluctantly accept where they are because they think what's the trade-off what am i actually gaining right now from privacy I, obviously i'm trying to protect myself uh, I'm trying to protect myself from various types of attacks, but most people, you know, like, I don't think they can contextualize why this is so important for their life and the trade-offs they have to do with it. It's like, well, you've got to get rid of, you, you know, you've got to learn all this technology, you've got to get rid of all these accounts every time you put information in somewhere, you've got to rethink about it. And I just think people are like, oh, I just can't be bothered. And I, I know it's sad, 
that's why I think maybe when things are solved at the tech level or or we, we push companies to be different. So, for example, I really like the thing Apple's done where you can basically, uh, when they want to create an account, you create with Apple and they allow you to use a fake email address and a fake ID. So you're not immediately signed up to some new website and all their data. They essentially don't know who you are. I think small changes like that actually make a massive difference. Every time now I'm required to get an account with someone, if I can do it with Apple, I do. Oh, get ready for authoritarianism then. Yep. <laughs> I mean, you're going to so, learn the hard way. I mean. So the on the topic of like why it's important, um, I'm actually I'm going to give a talk about this soon, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But um, come on my show and do. I'm. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that <laughs> we can we, do that. But the, well the short, the the short, the short of it is. Um, Privacy is a lot like health. So, you know, it's a standard part of it is privacy, like being able to use privacy tools or just not feeling like these kinds of like this adversarial thinking is an overhead is if you do it, like you have to start doing it. And if you do it frequently enough, it will become easy for you. Like someone, someone actually said the very same thing to me before. It's like, how do you think about all of this stuff? How do you like, it seems like too much to think about. And it is a lot to think about, but I've done it so often that like I don't consciously have to think about it and plan it. I just I have I have a set of behaviors that I do and I know the risks of taking, you know, certain routes over others and I just avoid them. And so I don't even think about it. I just do the thing that I know will probably keep me safe the best. And so it's not a big overhead for me. It is for people who haven't been practicing it, but it just takes practice. And health is a lot is the same way. Like for health, you know, it's a standard practice. You go to the bathroom, you wash your hands. If someone's not used to doing that and they have to like, you know, someone tells them, oh, you should be doing this and they have to start washing their hands every time they go to the bathroom, they might go, oh, this is too much to think about. I have to remember it every time. But people because they do it, they just do it and it keeps them healthy. Then there's some people that are like, well, washing your hands is enough. You have to like, you know, you have to take a shower twice a day. You have to, uh, especially with the pandemic, you have to wear a mask. You have to wear a specific type of mask. Like these are all things that we do to protect our health because we recognize that if we don't do them, we increase the risk of getting sick. We take preventative measures for health reasons. Like a lot of people, they recommend going to the doctor twice a year uh, because you're, you know, you're just checking, is everything okay? And even if you find nothing, you're still, you still have a data point. Everything is okay. Everything is okay. Okay. And when something changes, you know, okay, something's not okay. You change your behavior and privacy is a lot like that is it just takes practice. You start, you know, doing certain things you learn at every opportunity. And eventually it's not a huge overhead to, to at least, have this kind of threshold where you you know you've done certain things you know that certain information hasn't been disclosed to certain parties and it's not as hard to deal with anymore um so it's a lot like health is like it, it and also the problem is that the word privacy is kind of bad because like uh, like i'm sure that if you had a security researcher come on to your show you wouldn't ask them why is security important like people kind of have a baseline understanding that security is important at some level like it's not something you really question and so there's information security people that's actually the professional term for a privacy person um, a lot of information i mean there's other aspects to information security but privacy is basically information security it's knowing where certain information is it's knowing how how it's stored um who it's been shared with, things like that. Um, so I think if privacy people started calling themselves information security people, they wouldn't get those questions anymore because people would understand that privacy is security. Privacy is information security. Um, so I think it's kind of a language issue why people kind of, when they hear the word privacy, the first question that comes to their mind is like, oh, I have to justify why I should care or I have to ask this person why I should care. Well, perhaps this is the thing, the topic we could tackle then, but like why it's important. And I think just to keep it like in levels, okay, level one, these are all the ba absolute basic things you should do and why. And here's level two. And, and, and I guess people can then kind of decide for themselves what is like an acceptable level for them. Like I say, as, as someone with kids, 
who is rooted in a town there is there is a limitation to how much uh privacy i can have uh it, on certain issues there's certain bits of information i have to uh give out to certain um organizations or institutions as such but perhaps that's something you and i can work on janine step yeah, one you're, you're, you're gonna have to compete with Bob. <laughs> When you want to go to the speakeasy and have a drink because you're sick of lockdown bullshit in your crazy government lockdown, um, you're going to start caring about privacy and ask how to do that because you want to go get drunk at the speakeasy with your friends. Yeah, we're not allowed to do anything right now. We're in tier four, which is meant to be the toughest restrictions. And our prime minister came out this morning and said newer, tougher restrictions are coming. And I was like, there's nothing left. We're stuck at home. The speakeasy's coming back. A lot of people care about alcohol, Peter. You know, I'm just, I'm just saying, get given 2020 and where 2021 seems to be headed, um, I think a lot more people are going to start caring about these things than you think. Oh no, I agree. I agree. I think a lot of people already are. Um, I mean, I am my fried, but I just think it's like I look at it. It's just like, oh god, there's so much to do here. Where do I even? It's like the it's like that paradox of um that's not the paradox of choice but it's kind of like i'm like where do i even start like oh I, I, it's a bit like giving up smoking it's like oh, i'll do it tomorrow i'll do it the next day I was like, but i i know i'm like i'm consciously aware of it um and janine does a really great job in the background just like prodding and poking me to think about things and so maybe perhaps this is the starting point perhaps we, this is something we can work on together and uh, it's something i can improve and become a bit more of an advocate for peter why aren't you connected to this server over here? <laughs> wow it's actually very hard to use mumble over tor so yeah. how do you know how do you know i'm not using tor uh Come we run the server peter i can i could see your ip address if i care to yeah i don't I, yeah yeah tor's something i don't use enough i know i should i know i should but, but that's a starting point it's like i would probably want to sit down even before we make a sh like a show and just sit down and just like let's list everything out and I'll, I'll be able to go okay here's level one do this here's level two do that here's level three and you can gradually kind of work your way through what are the things that you can like i can personally do and i think that's a, i think that would be a healthy exercise yeah i i agree but uh in terms of poking and prodding uh you know because like i said we're doing this on bitcoin's birthday what are what are we going to poke and prod ourselves to do for the next year <laughs> well firstly you need to get a lambo that's obviously no <laughs> that's absolute high priority and figuring out which one to get but i'll uh i've, I've promised that we'll we'll go out for a drive in that janine when i get it so that's uh priority number one i think priority number two is privacy i don't know how you're gonna get me in that car like uh, neither am car I, to be honest i'd definitely get you in that car, car. See, like cars in general to me, I, I'm i just not interested in them in general because they're, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know this, like you buy the car and it's worth half as much once you drive it out of the dealership. So one, it's not something that I would ever spend Bitcoin on because it's like instant loss um, for something. Like if I'm thinking of it as something that would retain value out of, outside of its function. And then you're going for a fancy car, which basically the only function for that is to make people look at you and to drive it fast. And one, I don't want people to look at me, so I'm not interested in that. Um, second thing, drive fast. Where are you going to drive it in the UK? <laughs> are you going to go to a racetrack? Like, you cannot drive fast down any roads in the UK. <laughs> but this is just an, an elaborate troll myself. You do understand that, right? You're, you're trolling yourself or you're trolling others? Because... I think you might be trolling us, but I'm not sure. I am. I mean, getting you in a Lamborghini is it's like just a troll for me. You so, wait. So you're going to spend like I don't even know how much Lambos are worth. Like a hundred thousand? What is it? I think I'm probably going to get somebody else to pay for it. To be honest, Peter, if you buy well, a Lamborghini, oh. I will slap you. <laughs> I, I look forward to that slap. Monkey slap? How are you going to do that over but, the internet? But there are just things in life certain people like. You know, and one thing I've always liked ever since I was a kid is cars. I just like cars. And it's not about people like, oh, you're getting a Lambo because you're an attention seek. 
Like the first Lamborghini I had was a micro machine when I was about six years old, and I've just been fascinated with them ever since. And it's just something I like. Some people like technology, and some people like clothes, and some people like I don't know Bitcoin. I like cars. I always have, and and I'm not. It's not something I'm ashamed of actually. Photo shoot is not happening, Durango. Never. Huh? In in the chat, Durango is saying that I should do a Lambo photo shoot. It's not happening. Yeah. I I, I don't expect that'll happen. I'd have to actually get you in a Lamborghini, but if I did, I, I would I would I would probably get as much of a sense of achievement by doing that as you would of getting me to actually really take my privacy seriously. No, I'll, I'll I can get take you to a bunker if you let me drive. I, I I'd like to see you piss your pants. I think that'd be funny. Yeah, I mean, I'd be okay with that. But so I was <laughs> when I was talking about poking, uh instead of talking about cars, uh, I meant this year. I meant like what because you know originally this show was supposed to be about our experience as you know content creators, specifically doing podcasting for three or so years now um so like what are what are our goals in that way so my, my own personal goal is i've always wanted to be a filmmaker that's ever since i can remember um and it's just one of those things that's not possible you just I, I, how do you even get and then i stumbled into podcasting and uh at the start of this year i, I made my first couple of attempts, attempts at making some films i made the one in venezuela and the one in greece i learned again I learned so much about it in some ways they're like episodes one and two of my podcast and a lot more about podcasting now so my ultimate goal is just to be able to become a filmmaker so i'm going to continue working on the podcast and hopefully it makes the money that enables me to uh once we get out of this lockdown stuff to go back into trying to make more films again shinobi oh Honestly, I just want to get better at breaking things down for less technical people because that is honestly not something I would consider myself very skilled at. Hold up, I'm going to I'm going to challenge that. Um so my producer Danny uh has always waxed lyrical about when you came on my beginner's guide to Bitcoin and we did the tech part and uh, he said you were absolutely brilliant and that is one of his, his favorite shows that we've ever made. So I think I think you are. I just think you work well alongside maybe someone like me going, okay, just break that down a little bit more. But actually, no, you are you are probably better at, better at it than you think you are. Eh, maybe I'll get some recorded testimonials from friends to disprove that. Well, if you, do, I, I expect if you maybe if you're doing it on your own, but I think if you have someone alongside you, that's why like co-hosts sometimes are useful or somebody alongside you. But um, you, you, I, I, honestly, I think you are actually better at it than you think you are. What about you, Janine? What are my goals? What are your goals? Um, well, uh, given what day it is, uh, that my goals are going to be affected a lot by what happens tomorrow at uh, court in the Assange case. Yeah, what's what, where, where, what's the status of that right now? So tomorrow at uh, I somewhere around. 10 or 11 a.m. UK time, I can't remember exactly, the judge is going to decide um, whether she accepts or rejects the extradition request. And that's not the end of the story. There's another, uh, I can't remember the position, I think it's like Secretary of State or something, or the equivalent of that in the UK, who would then also approve it. Um, but basically, I mean, most people are predicting that she's going to accept it because her track record is like 96% acceptance of extradition requests. Um, so if that happens, then his lawyers, Assange's lawyers, are going to appeal. And if she rejects it, well, that still means that he, for some reason, has to stay in Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison because the U.S. government can appeal. So either way, he stays in prison for probably the next year or two. Fucking hell. It's terrible, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's I'm terrible because... I'm embarrassed about it <laughs> as a British person. Yeah, I mean, I think we could all be embarrassed because... Well, I'm not really embarrassed because I'm I'm not a statist, and so what the US government does is kind of like, well, I don't, I don't even pay you people that much to do anything, so I don't feel <laughs> no skin off my back uh, for what they do. Um, and I've never been a particularly... I've never been patriotic at all, actually. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm embarrassed. Well, not even that because I've, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really embarrassed, but it's like embarrassing to see mostly how the media is handling it. Like other journalists, the fact that they're constantly having this debate about whether or not he's a journalist as if that fundamentally matters to the situation at all. And then just not only that, but they're just constantly getting basic stuff wrong about the history of the case. Um, that screws everything up for everyone else like not only the public but it i mean i'm sure <laughs> that people who actually have consequence in the decisions are probably reading the media too and they're getting tricked by all of this false information i mean at this point it is just a propaganda machine to make an example yeah that's a lot of problems with journalism right now anyway like fundamentally it's the economics um I think Andreas actually did a really good talk about fake news, um, but fundamentally, I just don't think a lot of journalists working for large media organizations now have the time to de dedicate to doing things, spend enough time learning things, and they also have other agendas. Um, I just think the best the best people, the best journalists out there are people who have time, like someone like yourself, Janine, who has the time and is passionate enough to spend some time uh, on, on it. It's what what is required is someone like you, you probably to have a bigger platform or a voice so people actually hear it. Um, yeah, it's kind of sad, really. Which, uh, I mean, I don't know how much time you still want to spend with us, but I did want to, and not in a way like I really have a position on the matter, but I did want to hear more about um, your like how you define journalism to the extent that you don't consider yourself one or what you think you're doing that's not that doesn't qualify you for that label is it something to do with the fact that because in the uk it's different than in the us in the uk you know to be considered a journalist you kind of have to actually get a license whereas in the us um there is no press class there's no press license you can get that but the first amendment there's no press section like everyone can be press if they engage in journalistic activity technically that was shown in a supreme court decision so what how, how exactly do you categorize yourself differently from that yeah it's a good question it's something i wrestle with a bit actually because there is this kind of overlap between being a journalist and also providing entertainment in some ways um i certainly think i've done certain things feel journalistic um I th it's <laughs> one of the, one of the problems i also find with it is it's actually quite a depressing thing to do because a lot of the time when you, the stuff i'm doing so let's say the stuff that actually feels like journalism when i went to greece and i was at the the border with greece and turkey in turkey i, I honestly presented what i thought was going on and my honest views on the situation and i took a lot of shit for it i mean you go and read the youtube comments and there's a lot of shit from, from people um, it's quite a depressing thing to do to just kind of try and show some people the facts of a situation and then have an opinion on it to just get absolutely attacked for it. Um, yeah, journalism is something I really I, I struggle with. Um, I think, and also, I think some people will call you a journalist when they have expectations of you, and then they'll say you're not a journalist when when you're trying to p present a certain point across, and then. What are the mm -hmm. standards you also should be following as a journalist? So, what what defines what journalism is? It's it's become so blurred. It's it's not like the, the romantic days of proper investigative journalism. Um, I think don't think that exists as much anymore. I still think there's great work that's done. I think you can um, you can find great work, but there's been just it's almost like everyone's got a voice now. Um, so it's got trying to navigate all that kind of noise. You got people. Also, the thing I really frust get frustrated with right now is that people like absolutely lambast the mainstream media, and as they should at times, but will at the same time then follow some someone with on social media who will absolutely spout all kinds of irrelevant or false crap out there. Um, you know, so for example, people may hate. I mean, I'm not a fan of the New York Times, right? But they have, at some points, done some good work. There are some people there who've done some good work, but people absolutely fucking hate them. Yet they'll be out there fully supporting someone like Project Veritas, who to me are just a white right-wing propaganda machine. So it just, I don't know, I get a bit disappointed sometimes. I, 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 I'm, sometimes I'm like, where is the value in journalism anymore?
Well, I think part of the problem is, you know, you, you said that um, the good old days of journalism and the good old days of journalism was where people actually trusted these institutions that, you know, provided platforms for reporters to publish their work and to engage in investigation. And not only are a lot of those institutions disappearing, either because of lack of money or lawsuits or whatever, but also a lot of people have stopped trusting them because it turns out that they didn't ha they weren't trustworthy enough actually they they undermined it themselves in a lot of cases and i think a lot of the problem with fake news and now journalists asking how do we fix fake news um they're not looking at themselves enough like they're they're not thinking okay why are people willing to listen to some random person on twitter about like something vitally important like why is that person's voice more trustworthy than mine. They're not really asking that question. They're just kind of writing pieces about how, oh, look at all these stupid people listening to idiots on Twitter, instead of thinking, why have why has their trust in me been undermined? Yeah, I think um, Tim Paul's a really good example for me. When he first started doing a lot of his work, the films he made, I really liked the film he made out in uh, Sweden. I thought he did some really interesting work, but then... He, he kind of had the he kind of got wrapped up in that Twitter incentive to to start preaching to a particular crowd who want to hear a particular uh, tone of voice with with on certain topics, and I don't know. I just that was another example to me of like like where are we going with all this? It's like we used to have like trusted sources of news, but now everyone's been brought close together, and now everyone has an opinion, and everyone is arguing and. You know, like sometimes I think I can't even be bothered. What's the point? It's you know, sometimes it's more more fun to post a meme than it is to actually do a research piece or you know deep dive on a particular topic. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would be the main differentiator is that I I feel like the person who can call themselves a journalist is just someone who does try to represent their perspective as honestly as possible and is trying to search for the truth and. Even if, like, I, I don't think journalism doesn't, I, I think journalism can be entertaining. So just because you do entertainment or content that is entertaining, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not journalism if you're doing all of the other things. Like, actually, that's probably a problem of journalism is that they're on the internet, they're struggling to get people's attention, um, or at least get their attention and keep it in a way that is meaningful and not just for clicks. Like they're they're using all the strategies to get clicks, but not the strategies that keep people listening. And I feel like a lot of the independent people are doing, well, not a lot maybe, but at least a significant portion of the independent people now are doing the opposite. They're trying to do what people consider meaningful, even if it doesn't mean that they get a lot of attention in terms of clicks. And yeah. I think a lot of that, too, is just the dynamic between the legacy media and, like, these independent creators and just how the legacy media attacks independent figures. I mean, like, look at Alex Jones, for example. Um, I have never once heard the mainstream media call him out for batshit crazy, like, interdimensional alien shit. But they will try to call out, turn the friggin' frogs gay, which, as it happens, is a true thing. Like, <laughs> chemical pollution, having it, like, you see what I mean? There, there's a guy who spouts crazy, insane shit all the time, but everything the media tries to attack him for are the things he is saying that are true. Yeah, I just think he's a fucking moron. Um, I just, yeah, but there's, there's like uh, this kind of like moronic conspiracy Tim Four hat stuff. A lot of it sells. People are interested in it right now, um, and I get why. Um, but I just, I just haven't personally no interest in it. Um, it's, it's, it's almost like getting to that point where I'm like, like I, I'm a big fan of someone who's, you know, if someone does a really good, important piece of like journalistic work, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I really like uh, this guy, Jake Hanrahan, who's got a po uh, podcast called Popular Front. He does a lot of like interesting work looking at kind of modern warfare. I think it's really cool. It's really interesting what he's doing. But 
I'm just really becoming very kind of tired and and like reluctant to engage in following content covering big global important issues from big media organizations because everything it just becomes a fight everything is just everything is an argument now it was like i was making this series kind of kind of about trump and this um one of the ladies i interviewed she said we can't even agree on basic facts anymore like everyone's just happy to lie and go along with lies and it's just all kind of like a little bit depressing and then, then perhaps like well if you can't win then just don't play the game just withdraw from it all um I, and i just don't think there's enough money for proper journalism these days proper investigative journalism i just don't think the money the money exists for it these days it doesn't sell you know we're a, we're a, we're in we're in the era of clickbait and uh, the economics have changed so much that i just it's just not enough good work out there i would i would disagree slightly on that i don't i think there is money out there i think people do want to support it um like i i personally um, a lot of the pieces that I've done, I haven't taken any money for it, but I get people messaging me all the time asking how they can support it. And I don't, I don't at the moment have something set up because I was focusing so much on the work. And I think that's like, like we're, I mean, not that I'm a huge, I think Subzac is largely just another media company that doesn't editorialize. Like, I don't think they're fundamentally different, but the reason Substack is successful is because a lot of journalists are, you know, they want to know how much people are willing to give them individually for their work. They're tired of the advertising funded model, which isn't really working anymore. Like that part is going away, but I do think there is money. It's just a matter of like, are journalists offering that option? And two, do the, does the financial system and the payment uh, mechanisms actually work um because like there's a lot of stuff still being built in bitcoin um like the the podcasting 2.0 thing uh like that's available now people can pay waiting it's very cheap and obviously that's for you know that's for people who know how to use lightning but there's similar things available for bitcoin so it's just a matter of like are you offering options that people are actually able to use to pay you and i think for the large part a lot of journalists aren't doing that yet. They're still assuming that they're only going to get money if they get hired by a media organization that's doing advertising or a subscription model, which with that, you don't know which journalists you're paying most of the time. You only know that you're paying this media organization $5 a month. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. Um, I actually find Substack quite interesting because I can support and I do support probably four or five different journalists on there. Um, and I like some of their work. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think, yeah, you raised some tricky issues there because, um, marketing itself is, um, is, uh, Adam Curry said to me, is like marketing is, sorry, sponsorship itself is censorship. Once you have uh, advertisers, you essentially have to censor yourself, which is, you know, an interesting point. Um, and I don't disagree. Like there are people are out there willing to pay, but if you're a journalist and trying to, you've got an option of going to get a job or establishing a sub, uh, substract. Like how, how much work does it take to actually get, so you can actually earn a livable wage off it. Perhaps you have to do it on the side. Perhaps you don't even get to that point. Perhaps you can't, you know, you know, maybe, I mean, I've tried to sell my content, right? It's so much work. It's so hard. And, you know, I just really struggle to make it um, a profitable business model. Well, maybe you should uh, tell Danny to explore, uh, the Sphinx chat and all that and see how many people you get with that. Oh, listen, I'm sure we can, but we, we, I think we're going to be talking about hundreds of dollars rather than you know, t tens of thousands. And, and what I've got with what I'm doing now is the ability to go out and create more content, more interesting. Like, for example, look, Defiance doesn't make any money. It loses money, but I'm, and I'm happy to do that. And I'll have three producers working on full time on interesting content ideas. But that's paid for because I have got sponsors. I just wouldn't have been able to get to that point um, via lightning donations. It's a start. I'm not saying it's not not the future, but right now it's just there isn't enough in it uh, to make it a profitable business model. Well, yeah, I mean, because I... Bitcoin's not penetrated deeply enough into enough people's hands. Yeah, but we get in there, aren't we? Perhaps, perhaps Janine, we should try and figure a way of. It's maybe if you can use my platform to elevate some of the things that you want to talk about a bit more, um, if that's a potential, if you want to do it, I'm happy to look into that. 
Janine's uh, amazing journalism and Pete's business acumen together in a beautiful relationship. Yeah, I am. Uh, Shinobi knows very well that I am terrible at self marketing. <laughs> yes, but you should. Yeah, but I, I don't imagine you reading out a block by advert at the start either. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Hey, Peter, that would be I a d- tough one. I dare you to talk shit about BlockFi. Well, I just have no shit to talk about them. Like, I like them as a company. I like the way they run themselves. Um, I well, think I didn't got a good say you had to have legitimate shit. I just dare you to talk shit about them. Well, no, I wouldn't do that. They've been really good to me, supported my business for, for over two years now. I just wouldn't do that out of respect. Um, if I had a legitimate concern or criticism... I would say it, and I would, you know, I'd happily uh, call up Zach and talk about it. But actually, I don't. Um, I don't have any. I mean, I think what happened with the data was bad, and I think they did what their best to deal with it, and they've learned from that. Um, but outside of that, I actually, I admire them as a business. I like, I like what they're doing. You just made a real time listener happy. Huh? What was that? I said you just made one of the live listeners very happy to hear you say that. Really? In what way? Oh, he's a big fan of BlockFi. Yeah, I, I like the company. I like what they're doing. I mean, it's look, it's completely optional. No one's being forced to use BlockFi. It's a it's an optional service. They've um, yeah, every criticism they've had, they've handled. Uh, everyone was worried about a black swan, and March I think March twelfth, they completely handled it. Yes, some people got liquidated, but you know, those people knew the terms of the service when they took it out. But structurally, the business is sound. It's paying out a lot of interest. Uh, it's providing a service to people who want to borrow Bitcoin. I think in um, you know, in a Bitcoin-based economy, people are going to re- require the ability to borrow money to, you know, for whatever reason, to launch businesses or you know, buy houses, or whatever it is. And I think they're building some of the infrastructure for that. I think it's, I, th- I like what they're doing. I mean, I don't like the, you know, so for example, there was a time where I think they were about to, uh, well, no, as an example, they, you know, they, they, they don't have just uh, Bitcoin. They have other assets on the platform, but I've, been very you know, vocal from the start with Zach. I will only ever talk about the Bitcoin products. I've got no interest in the others, and he's cool with that. So, like, I, I, it's not like I'm I'm providing like free cover for these companies. Um, yeah. Same with um, a Kraken. You know, I only ever talk about Bitcoin and never talk about Ethereum or other cryptocurrencies. I tell them I'm happy to promote all the things they do with Bitcoin, but everything else I'm not interested with. I I would actually. I mean, I don't. I hope you're not offering me to read off your sponsorship messages because one, I don't have I don't have a good enough voice that that would be worth. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, but, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm trolling you, but I actually do think that that we could certainly work on ideas for some content. Uh, if you wanted to do any kind of like deep research pieces or you know make any shows, like we've got budget to um, actually put money in front of you so you can go and spend and do that, and we've got platforms to launch it on. So if you wanted to do stuff you could and you don't have to read any advert at all you can just go and i mean we did this piece about Ghislaine maxwell a seven parter that my friend tom worked on and it's great like this stuff scales now we've got the ability to allow people to, to like pay people to go and do research pieces if they want yeah how are you actually um because you know i i noticed when you separated uh defiance into its own thing like how do you for defiance in particular, how do you choose those topics? Because I, I think I, sorry, my cat in the background is making noise. Um, I listened to most of the Gizlane episodes, I think. Um, and I was just kind of wondering how you like, how did you make the decision to focus on that as a topic? Is it just because everyone was talking about it and there was a, you know, legal action happening or like what i mean i know what the general focus of defiance is but what how do you choose what to focus on for that yeah it's a good question because i would say the end of last year for defiance was a test and learn exercise so we tried the interview style like the bitcoin show and it just didn't work it just didn't take off people just weren't into the those interviews we were getting in and and i just felt like as a brand it might be so we sat down and said i think what we should do is let's try doing uh, more deep kind of like topics. Let's get into our uh, more interesting topics uh, and actually create like mini kind of like documentaries. So rather than interviewing one person, you interview a series of people, you pack it up and tell a story. So what we've done is essentially a test and learn to see what people are interested in. Uh, and, you know, it, 
I would say some of the stuff doesn't feel like it belongs under the name Defiance. That's true. I, I, pe people can easily argue that. But at the same time, there just are topics that we really want to touch. Like, you know, you could say, so we did the, um, the four-parter about that band, The Ghost Inside, which I think was some of our best work last year. It's a really engaging topic. You could argue and say, well, look, they defiantly got back together as a band. Um, and, you know, that that was a story of defiance. You know, they were broken as human beings and spent four years in hospital before they got back on stage. And that was an act of defiance. But it's not like a, an act of defiance in the original kind of context of what we set up the, the, the brand to do. I think what I've, I've realized is that I, there are certain topics I want to do, which are which feel like it sits under the original ethos of defiance. But I think I need to touch on other topics that, to just kind of like expand the reach. So, for example, if we cover Ghislaine Maxwell, people are really interested in that as a topic. They might stick around and then listen to the interview I did with the two people from Nigeria uh, talking about NSARS. It's a bit mm -hmm. like, you know, a bit like Joe Rogan, right? He gets on Elon Musk and such and such, and then he's able to do all the other stuff he wants to do. So I think, I think divine the way to think of defiance is now going to be more like a channel which we will cover a range of kind of topics on which we think are interesting but that allow us to do the kind of like personal projects so for example next year what we've just one thing we launched is these binge series they only work if you release them as a binge right if you release them weekly you just get this massive tail off um we've been working on a story now for three months about britney spears which is a really interesting topic about how she's essentially um she doesn't have the right right to make her own decisions. All her decisions are being made for by her family. There's lots of weird stuff going on in there. So we find that's a really interesting topic, but that's going to be like a seven, eight parter. So we're not going to release that now till all the parts are done. And while we're doing that, we're making a bunch of other kind of single topic episodes. And it really is just as a team, like people pick the stories they like if they want to research it. I'm doing one now on you know, the kind of that regulatory migration. Uh, Tom is doing one about the guy who used to work for Stratton, uh, what are they call the 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 company that the film the Wolf of Wall Street was about. He basically, when he left prison, couldn't get a job. He's ended up building a company that helps people as they get out of prison get get into work. So we're going to make one about that. We're going to do one about uh, uh, drug regulations. So I think what we're trying to do is, I I would say Defiance is trying to do what uh, Vice was doing. You know maybe eight years ago nine years ago without the kind of like we're not we don't really have that kind of like sexy kind of edge to it like they had but we're just trying to cover those kind of interesting topics but we're aware that sometimes we need to probably cover some which are a bit more mainstream so we can bring the audience into the, for the other topics i am biting my tongue so hard right now don't just why say, just say what you're thinking defy your tongue shinobi Oops, I did it again. Yeah, but this is, a, listen, the story isn't about like a celebration of Britney Spears. It's a story <laughs> about, it's a story about how, you know, in the US, there are a lot of people now who have the, their lives, the, the choices in their lives, these are adults, handed over to somebody else. It's, it's quite murky. It's actually a really fascinating topic. And when you go into it, then you actually could, like learn about her childhood and how, you know, the impact of being a child star. And I think, I think, I think it's a, personally. I think it's a fascinating subject. If we only do like anarchist, defiant stories every week, there's just not enough of an audience for it to economically pay for itself. So we just broaden our horizons and do some other kind of interesting stuff as well. But I think it's a fascinating story. But you can skip that one. That's the great thing. I will. I mean, I probably will. I mean, I can. I, no, I mean, I personally would actually be interested in that one because, in general, I'm interested. I can actually see how it fits under the Divine's umbrella because a lot of these celebrities, especially her, like defiance, like the fact that they're defying, I don't know, authority or whatever it is. They they kind of have defiance, like they're de a defiant person as their public image. Like she comes across to me as you know that's how she is as a singer, um, sometimes as an actress. Um, but then behind the scenes, like you said, they're, they're just, their whole life is controlled. They're not actually defying anything. Um, it's all a marketing gimmick. Like they're, they don't have a lot of, I mean, even celebrities who don't do that in general, their lives are highly controlled just because everyone knows what they look like. You know, every time they go out in public, people recognize them. They can't go anywhere without being, you know, followed by paparazzi or fans or whatever, like, 
even the ones that are in control largely of like their finances and what movies they go into and such like their lives are like super restricted that's part of the reason why uh, part of my motivation for going more extreme than others in terms of privacy is because I don't know whether I will ever become famous. Being in Bitcoin might be enough to make me, like being early enough in Bitcoin might be enough to make all of us super famous one day, or at least famous to the point where people like are trying to figure out where we live and think. And so I'm motivated to pursue privacy because I'm really worried about the idea of having that kind of life of not being able to walk out the door freely and just go somewhere and not have people follow me and assault me constantly either because they love me or they hate me oops uh, <laughs> well i think it's going to be a fascinating story and tom is a, um, a real wordsmith and uh he's a far better presenter than i am and i i'm actually very i think he did such a great job with the galane series like he didn't follow the conspiracy again that was a really interesting one you go and read the youtube comments and people are like oh why didn't you like look up the clintons because and it's just like there is no absolutely zero evidence that bill clinton was involved in any uh, or, uh, uh relations with underage children he flew on the jet and that's not great and he had a relationship with a crappy person but as soon as he became exposed he you know, disentangled himself from him. We have, if you can conject, you can you can use conjecture, but like if there's no evidence there, it doesn't exist. Um, we felt absence we feel like absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I know, and saying Shinobi. saying the evidence is not evidence itself as well. So I just would rather and all that stuff already exists out there. We wanted to focus on what is the real evidence. What can we actually see, and what can we take from this? You know, one of the my take take from it is that I actually fundamentally believe he killed himself. Like we have a meme that's running that he didn't. So much in the public eye that everyone believes he was murdered in prison. I just completely disagree with that. I just don't think he did, um, and that came out of doing the research and and uh, and, and investigating it. See journalism. Journalism. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean. We'll be creating lots of interesting content next year, and um, uh, I would uh, absolutely love to work with you on a piece if you want to do it, uh, Janine. If you want to a particular story you want to get out there, then uh, you absolutely can do it if you want. Sure. Hey, Peter, you know that um, the Clintons came out of the Dixie mob, right? Shinobi, don't go down this road. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, I think we've come to a worthy conclusion now we can do conspiracies another time something that keeps popping into my head especially with the assange case is like you know technically the government is the conspiracy theorist now because their whole case is you know a theory of a conspiracy right well i think that is a whole topic that we we could or should, should perhaps uh, work on. Uh, you know, I know his father, John Shipton, right? Yes. I say I know him. I mean, I've done an interview with him and I can talk to him again. But uh, I think um, if you wanted to do that whole story, you wanted to uh, release that, um, I could help you do that. Sounds good. Excellent. Let's do some business. Uh, I am Sorry. going to have to wrap up soon because um, my children are wanting some father time before bedtime good that's a good thing to have yeah we need to go make some tiktok videos you need more to. uh more pampering i love trolling you lot my what? daughter hate my so this is really really funny you're gonna like this one Janine. my daughter was absolutely desperate for tiktok and she had it and i made her remove it a while back and so she came back to me and she said okay can i have tiktok if i use uh false information don't put my photo up and uh, use a false name. I was like, okay, uh, you can do that. Good. Level one privacy for a 10 year old. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a, it would be a good thing if she just started doing that in general. I mean, that's something, because the part of, part of why I'm able to do what I do is because from a very early age, that's just something that I did. Like I, you know, there was the whole stranger danger narrative um, in person as well as on the internet. And so I, that was just my strategy because I was like, this is how you keep, this is how I keep myself safe. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of 
<laughs> there's a lot of ways that you can still have fun while still having privacy. Um, it doesn't mean you have to give up on fun. Uh, you just have to think creatively. Alrighty. Well, I will. Uh, I will get my kids to think in in that way as well. I have a wholly much more fascistic idea. I don't think kids should be allowed on the internet except streaming things uh, until a, a decent age. But see, Shinobi, that strategy doesn't work because it didn't work on you, did it? Um, I'm totally not thinking back to muffling the modem on my computer with all my pillows and blankets at all at 3 in the morning when I was a kid. Yeah, because that, that's also the problem with kids. If you put up if you put up restrictions without making them understand why they're important and why they matter, and you just put them there, they're just going to defy you and go around them like we all did. I do really need to get to uh, go and spend some time with them because it's uh, 9.15 here in my time zone. Alrighty then, Peter. But thank oh. you for having me on. Nobody invites me on podcasts, so thank you. Yeah, I, I, I heard. It was a call to arms and janine heard it yeah uh, it, it was fun and um I'm, I'm gonna drop this on you before you go um since we're, we're doing this show once a month together uh, on technical subjects um at the end of the year and maybe halfway mark of the year you're going to get a quiz <laughs> Ooh, i like that i'm into that okay great um do i get to know the topics in advance nope Draw, testing, testing. All right, well, listen, we need to plan the first show. We need to record it in a couple of weeks. I think we should do UTXOs. Yeah, makes sense to me. Let's do that shit. I was actually surprised how much I knew when we started discussing that. I don't know where I've learned that. It must have like sunk in through osmosis somehow. It was, uh, it was uh, the part of you that didn't want to pretend to not know things anymore. <laughs> do you know what? M Matt was wrong. I like... I did uh, it, like when he was saying I was protect, like lying. I I genuinely still don't understand X pubs, but I will I will get around to understanding them. Yeah, I mean I, I I believe you. I just you know that will be on the quiz. All right. Well, I look forward to that quiz. But listen, look, thanks for having me on. This was uh, very cool. And uh, Janine, we should talk about making some cool content, some cool content at some point. And you're well overdue coming on the show. We need to do that as well. Cool. All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed. Catch you later, punks. Later. Bye. Bye.